Hi, John. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How about you? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and the audio podcast. You are John Barge, a professor of psychology at Yale. I am. Where I think you direct the, what, the Automaticity and Cognition Motivation and Evaluation Laboratory? Yeah, it's just an excuse to call it ACME. Oh, ACME. I didn't even get that. Ha! Huh. Oh, well worth, well worth the trouble then. Well, we started with Acme and worked our way back to find the words that would that makes justify think it. Of, uh, the Roadrunner cartoons, is absolutely, time well spent. Um, so, uh, automaticity uh, refers to kind of uh, the idea that a lot of our behavior is uh, unconsciously mediated. It happens without our making conscious decisions about it, which has been kind of the unifying theme of your research. And we're going to talk about the book of yours that uh, kind of uh, summarizes your your research. It's called Before You Know It. There I'm going to hold up the audiobook version because that's what I got. Oh, okay. I'm hold up the actual book there. There's that's the actual the old, book. Old book. Subtitle is The Unconscious Reasons We Do What We Do. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about this whole business of how much of what we do is unconsciously mediated the experiments, a uh, long line of experiments that uh, that are designed to to study this effect, many of which you've done. We're also going to talk about the whole replication issue in psychology because uh, if you if you Google uh, replication crisis, it'll fill it. The autofill will say in psychology that that's um, right. It, it's become a big uh, thing because um, for a couple of reasons. One is that just most experiments people finally realize don't get nobody tries to replicate them no, you know you, so, so there's no yeah. there's no second party kind of corroborating them and then they discovered that um uh actually when you try to replicate them some of them seem not to hold up or at least the same effect is not found by the people who try to replicate them uh, this has been true with some of the studies we're going to talk about uh so i i throw that out as a, as a caveat and we'll, we'll we'll get into the replication stuff at the end um, which is a very interesting subject in its own right, because for mm -hmm. one thing, uh, when experimenters do make errors, if that is the case, if that is the, re the reason they fail to replicate is that the initial experimenters made errors, that could be the effect of unconscious processes at work, right? It's possible it goes that way. Uh, it, it can go either way. Uh, unconscious biases work in both directions. Yep. It can also work uh, to influence uh, a failure to replicate if right. people are skeptical about about that effect. Um, for example, if a finding goes against someone's pet theory, uh, they may try to replicate and may not realize they have an unconscious bias operating right. against replicating. So it could right. go either way. And then there is such thing as out and out fraud, but I think that's not what accounts for most of it. There have been some cases, there was a case of a Dutch psychologist that they wrote up in the New York Times Magazine some years ago, fascinating uh, study, which was actually yes. in this genre of experiment. It was a, I think it was a priming study. So called priming. Uh, actually, he did not do priming studies. Oh, he, uh, he started to do very outlandish kinds of uh, ridiculous studies. Uh, just to, he says in his book he wrote about that, uh, that he was trying to get caught. He was trying to push it uh, and was laughing at the fact that no one suspected he was making all of the stuff up. It was very self justifying. But actually, what he did was very safe social judgment kinds of studies, impression formation studies, and never anything that was. Uh, that was going to catch anyone's eye as being uh, unusual or controversial. Oh, I thought I remembered a case where, like, people who saw some kind of sign while at a bus stop later had some kind of thing, which would be an example of a priming study, an unconscious priming study. Yeah, he was doing those studies, he says in his book, deliberately to uh, try to uh, push it to be uh, outlandish and trying to get caught. Okay. But his body of research for his whole career was social judgment. Okay, I see. Okay, so anyway... Let's start by talking about the unconscious. Let's start by talking about a dream you had about an alligator, which you report in the book, uh, I guess about 12 years ago, which, uh, you know, there are famous dreams in the history of science. I forget the one about the snake and then like a carbon molecule or something. I don't know. Some, it's, yeah. it's very famous. People. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but yours was about an alligator. Right. Well, Kekulé is the guy you're thinking of. He was uh, trying to figure out the benzene ring structure of the molecule and, okay. and uh, tried for years to do that and finally fell asleep, dozed in front of the fire and had a, draw, a dream where a fiery snake was eating its own tail and he came up with the circular uh, structure of benzene. Uh, I, I'm not going to say I'm a famous scientist, but I had a similar experience. 
where I was exhausted from uh, uh, being with my uh, six month old daughter uh, and, and, and she would never take a nap. So I finally collapsed in a September afternoon in my bed in New Haven uh, and uh, had this very vivid dream that lasted probably only a minute or so. And I woke up immediately and the dream was uh, I was at the Everglades National Park um, walking along a platform looking down at the swamp and an alligator was uh, sort of cruising along next to me very slowly and I was walking and looking at him and he was looking at me and then suddenly he went a little ahead of me and flipped over on his, on his back and looked right at me and I woke up immediately and I had the answer to a puzzle that I had been uh, worrying about and thinking about uh, for about 10 years. And it's, it seems like, why would that give me an answer to a, a problem? What it did was it flipped, uh, he flipped on his back and it was telling me to flip my assumptions. I had been always assuming that everything that happens, uh, that, that all the unconscious processes we develop, like when we're typing or driving, and these are, they're, these are always skills that we start out consciously to do and then over time become unconscious. My alligator was telling me it's the other way around. Everything is, starts out unconscious and becomes conscious. And evolutionary history with the infants developing skills when they're babies and this kind of thing and it helped explain a lot of the new developmental research which is fascinating just starting last 10 years showing that infants and babies do the same kinds of things adults do but without life years and years of life experience so how could that be if it's, you need a lot of practice and experience to develop something that's unconscious mm -hmm. we have infants doing the same thing that adults are doing Okay, you're not saying there are no cases where things start consciously, like learning a task, but but no, there's, no, no. there's a whole category. Yes, right. And uh, I was the problem was with with my field, and and I was uh, immersed in it and steeped in it. That the only way something could become unconscious was was conscious first, and then through practice becoming unconscious. And so it couldn't account for the infant data, the baby data, and other kinds of sort of innate evolutionary kinds of. Uh, uh, influences on us that uh, do not come from a lot of personal experience. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the infant studies that you think are most important? There's, there's great studies now with infants cooperating with each other. Uh, just by seeing a, a two dolls uh, in a sort of a friendly uh, uh, orientation towards each other, 18-month-old, uh, uh, one-and-a-half-year-old children are three times more likely after seeing that to help an experimenter when she drops a toy. They spontaneously go over and pick up the, uh, uh, the toy or the sticks or whatever she was uh, bringing over for them to play with. And if you don't have that little orientation of the dolls that shows friendship and bonding, they, they're much less likely, only 20% of them bothered to get up and help. And that's at 18 months. So there's uh, infants preferring attractive faces when they're newborns. Uh, they look more at attractive faces than not. Uh, they look at more at three months old. They look more at their same race faces of, of, their, of their parents than looking at other race faces. So a lot of the sort of in-group, out-group kinds of things and preference for attractive people uh, start at infancy or, or three months after birth. Hmm. Of course, with race, that could just be a byproduct of looking at people who look as much like your parents as possible. I mean, as Absolutely. opposed to like a race thing. Absolutely. That is what's going on there. And it's a, it's a preference for looking at people and being with people who are like you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And, uh, you know, you, I, I, maybe we should talk about your mentor. Uh, do you pronounce it Zionts? You're very close. I've heard it all different ways, but it's like science with a Z, so it's science. It's spelled Z-A-J-O-N-C. He's yes. a, he was very, not all that widely known, but I think very influential, and he, and he had a very distinctive kind of emphasis um, that I think is very important, personally, I'm a big fan of, and the idea was that we very, we automatically evaluate things. We make judgments about things right that's a that was a big he he did many things well uh, he's very famous for what's called the mere exposure effect that things that become more familiar to us we like just because they're more familiar without realizing it it even happens with things you only perceive subliminally don't even know you've seen it at all yet the more times it's shown to you the more you like it later on uh and he he was the person in 1980 who really broke with the established idea that the only way we like something is by thinking about it, weighing its features, coming to some decision. And he said, no, this, our, we have immediate likes and dislikes. He used to hold up cards of abstract art in his office to visitors and say, which one do you like? 
And immediately you'd know you like the Clay or Kandinsky or the Mondrian, uh, whatever one you like. And then it, you would immediately then say, why? And I, he did it to me when I was a, a new graduate student there. And I was going, I don't know, uh, you know, the color. I would fumble for a reason. And he said, that's exactly the point, that you didn't think about it. You didn't have reasons, uh, but you knew immediately what you liked. And so this immediate kind of affective response then became very influential in social psychology because it underlies things like stereotyping and bias and other kinds of attractions and things that we have without immediate, without uh, thinking about it in sort of a deliberate way. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that there's evidence that really a wide variety of objects that you might not think, you know, elicit super strong reactions. People do tend to have, however subtly, a positive or negative affective reaction to, right? Just objects. Yeah, we have some uh, really recent research. Anton Goldwitzer, who's uh, a graduate student at Yale, uh, we have a paper in Nature that came out last December showing that you have, we, we all have preferences for uh, consistent patterns, like a series of triangles or things in the same color or lines that are parallel. And when we see things that break a pattern, so a series of, of triangles and then there's a circle and then there's more triangles, things like that annoy us. And it turns out that some people are, are annoyed more by broken patterns and lack of regular patterns uh, than other people are. And this individual difference in dislike of these broken patterns predicts racism and also prejudice against LGBT individuals. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a, a correlation around the world with Chinese and, and uh, people and people from Jordan as well as North America. Uh, it's very robust and it's, very, it's found in three to five year old children too as he did a study in Central Park showing uh, uh, with the children there, showing the same kinds of effects. So is, it's is an it? underlying uh, preference for physical things, right? It's not as a triangles and lines and things, but yet it, it relates to our social preferences. Now, is that correlated with openness on the big five uh, personality? We, he, he is a personality psychologist, and he cannot find yet a underlying uh, personality dimension that, that, uh, that predicts okay. this effect. Not yet. Okay. So anyway, I just mentioned uh, Zions, uh, or Zions or whatever, but, but, uh, you know, by way of um, saying that there's a lot of reason to think that we're doing a lot with our minds before we start consciously thinking about things. We've often formed, made little judgments about not just people, but things. Uh, and, and just incidentally, um, I wrote a book about Buddhist meditation where this played a large role, and I drew on his work pretty heavily because a big part of, of meditation is, um, is becoming aware of how subtly affect infuses your perception and your thoughts. And I think that in turn is a larger theme in contemporary psychology, right? That, that to think of like cog the cognitive apparatus on the one hand and the affective or emotional apparatus is just too simple. It's much, much more intertwining. It is, and there's a lot of our sort of innate preferences. I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, attractive people. Uh, looking at attractive faces actually directly activates the reward uh, region of our brain, the, the striatum where, where reward is, uh, the more rewarding or pleasurable something is, the more it act is activated. Merely looking at attractive faces activates that reward center. And there's a large study of uh, Italian uh, uh, job uh, applicants and hiring positions uh, about five years ago, a major paper, 11,000 uh, applicants to these jobs. Uh, and they, they tested, sent these uh, applications, the identical application to these job uh, openings, uh, but attached an attractive photograph, an unattractive photograph, or no photograph. With the same application, 57% of the attractive women were called for an interview. 6% of the unattractive women were called for an interview. And these were the identical applications. The same thing happened for men, but not as big of an effect. And, and people were shocked. They said, this is not how we hire people. This is not supposed to be a basis for our hiring decisions. And what that shows is the feeling, the positive feeling you get from someone who's attractive is misattributed. People thought, I thought this was a better application. I mm. thought this person was more qualified. Uh, same thing happens in biases going the other way, that you think someone is not qualified, but it's really the feeling you get from, say, a racial stereotype or gender stereotype it's that you don't really know the source of it, and you think it's because of what you're focusing on, which is the application. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk a little about politics, because I think uh, you talk about this in the book, and uh, it's an interesting realm. For starters, there's this finding about the connection between your aversion to 
disease and germs on the one hand and your views on immigration on the other. And I think you did some of this work. I think other people have done some as well. Is that right? Uh, we did the immigration flu studies. Uh, other people have done studies showing that uh, uh, there's many studies in political psychology in the past showing that you can make a liberal into a conservative by threatening them, by having them feel threat or, or fear. And that drives people to become more conservative in their political attitudes. There's a lot of studies 20 years ago on that. Okay. Tell us about uh, the tell us about the flu study. Yeah. So I had a wonderful uh, grad student who's now a professor at Stony Brook named Julie Wang. Uh, and her idea was there was these evolved kinds of systems that influence our even abstract attitudes, like our political attitudes and political orientations. And what she showed was that during, this was back when the H1N1 virus was uh, prevalent in uh, 2011 or 12. And uh, we were just starting to get those Purell antibacterial uh, hand washing stations at Yale uh, for the first time all over campus. And it was a very serious thing. So what she did was people going into the dining hall, she first raised their uh, awareness of uh, the fact that we have this flu epidemic and uh, it was important to get a flu shot. And so then after that, she said, okay, that was the sort of public service message. Uh, but then she gave a study uh, to them to do. And the study was just attitudes towards immigration. And what happened was the people who were uh, reminded about the flu virus uh, but had not yet gotten a flu shot, we found that out after the study. We asked them if they'd gotten the flu shot yet. So these are people you raise the threat of the flu, but they had not been protected by the flu shot. They had more negative, significantly negative attitudes towards immigration. But the people we raised the threat to and had, it turned out, gotten the flu shot, felt safe from it, and they felt safer, so they had more positive attitudes towards immigration. And you think, well, why in the world would your flu shot uh, status or your uh, washing your hands with a different study uh, uh, affect your immigration attitudes? And that's because there's a very powerful metaphor that immigrants into your country are like germs into your body. And we need to protect ourselves from contamination uh, at the personal level from germs with our physical health, but also our country uh, being contaminated, our culture, from people outside coming in and changing the culture and changing our country. That's a very powerful metaphor. Our politicians use it uh, very specifically about um, disgusting uh, immigrants or uh, these kinds of uh, sort of, uh, you know, bacterial kinds of analogies that are almost explicitly used to talk about immigrants and being dirty and being filthy and being disgusting. Um, and uh, it actually is very influential and powerful uh, of, a, of an effect on people's attitudes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, so it sounds like you think this is working just at the metaphorical level. In other words, it's not like an evolved trait that when disease is rampant, it for some reason made sense for our ancestors to be foreign or averse. I mean, because for one thing, if disease is rampant, you probably got it from people you know, not from foreigners. Right. right? So you're not right. saying it's, it's like an evolved, it's an adaptive response. Is that right? You're saying it's, a, it's just... Well, there, it, it, I actually think it's both. I think in this case, you know, the Jared Diamond book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, you know, made very clear that uh, when people come from a different part of the world into an entirely new area, for example, for the Europeans into the Americas, they did bring just germs and diseases with them that uh, the people, uh, endogenous people, were not um, prepared for, didn't have any defense against. So historically, yes, I think this is a, a, a historical evolutionary kind of uh, response to people who are different, that they could be, uh, you know, having germs or viruses uh, with them that, um, that could harm you because you have no defense against them. So I think that's part of it. That's an evolutionary part of it. But this idea of cleanliness and disgust is, uh, is also affects moral judgments. People uh, uh, deciding uh, about the severity of a, of a sentence for people who do an immoral act or, or morally bad things uh, come up with a stronger harsher sentence for that crime if they're in a dirty room when they make the decision mm -hmm. yeah I, I think from an evolutionary biology standpoint one question would be how frequent were the kinds of things Jared Diamond talks about I mean how often did did visibly different peoples come into contact and bad things happen if it happened enough I can I can imagine an adaptation but anyway I think that's yeah. one of the theoretical questions I mean and and I know disgust has been um, has been widely studied and is clearly a deep uh, impulse of diverse application. Um, and I, I guess it's one of a number of feelings that I guess we'd all be better citizens if we were more aware of how politicians evoke various 
feelings like this? Well, you know, we just had an instance. Uh, I, I have a Facebook page for the book called, you know, Before You Know It is on Facebook. And I wrote a little post on there because uh, we just had a presidential alert for the first time. What are these presidents? Everyone's phone, what, 218 Eastern Time? You know, I'm happy uh, to say that didn't happen with my phone. Oh, good. I was wondering, like, was it something I said? I mean, uh, I, it might be. It might be. You, you say a lot of things and it's public, so maybe there is something to that. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we uh, were having a lab meeting at the time at our Acme lab. We all took out our phones and we saw who got in. I'd say about three fourths of us did get one of these presidential alerts. But the whole point of them, it says specifically, it's to uh, alert us in case of nuclear attack or uh, a concerted terrorist attack on multiple cities at the same time. So that basically the presidential alert is a reminder that there's major threats out there. And this is right before the November election. I wouldn't be surprised if we get another one in a couple of weeks uh, before the November election, because we know fear and threat makes people more conservative. I actually would be. I think that would be too obvious, but maybe I'm, <laughs> uh, maybe I'm overestimating uh, somebody. The, um, uh, okay, so so um, there's uh, yeah there, there's that whole. Bo- I mean, one more thing about politics. This is a finding. I don't think this is your finding, but you mentioned. I guess there's a fairly well established correlation now between fear and conservatism. Again, it's not absolute. It's not a statement about all conservatives or, or all fearful people. But I guess the correlation itself is somewhat well established. And the as is the fact that by making people more fearful, you can make them answer uh, things on a questionnaire that indicate more conservatism? Absolutely. But this, re- this, uh, this research is fascinating because there's so many different kinds of studies showing the same effect. For example, uh, some researchers at Berkeley followed up four-year-olds. They found that who was the more scared, a four-year-old at a loud sound or a, a burst of air at their face or something startling, And then they followed them up. And at age 23, the ones who were more scared at age four were more conservative in their attitudes at age 23. So 20 years later as adults, there's been neural imaging studies, fMRI studies showing that the amygdala, which is the basically the fear center of the brain is larger in conservatives than it is in liberals. So there's a whole lot of corresponding converging evidence on this. This is the amygdala or the, I think in your book, it said the right amygdala or the right amygdala. Yes. So so there are two amygdalas and one is more correlated with fear? It's a symmetrical part of the brain. It it exists uh, across the bilateral division right down the middle. Um, So there's a left and right side. And for some reason, it's the right amygdala that's larger than the left. It's, I don't know enough about that to say why it's not both sides, um, why it's not bilateral. Uh, But the point is the right is, uh, the amygdala in general is an emotional center. I think it's uh, a little little, um, simplifying, too simplifying, to say that it's only fear because yeah, I think it it other mediates, emotions too. I think it mediates some positive uh, yeah, it does. feeling as well. Uh, has that experiment been replicated? Because that's yeah, one of those things where I just yeah. think that's, you know, from my standpoint as a liberal, it's like too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, here, here's what I'll say, because I, I talk to people who are more conservative uh, and I'm from an area of the country that's more conservative. Uh, and I, I'll, I will say this, it's not a bad thing at all to be uh, worried about physical threat. It's not a bad thing at all to be um, focused on things that are dangerous. Uh, I think 75, I was at a, a, a talk in Cambridge and there was a, a panel of generals uh, talking and when they pointed out that 75% of the people in our military in the US uh, come from the Southeast uh, quadrant of the United States, uh, which is known to be more of a conservative red state area. Uh, so what, what uh, is going on here is that these are people concerned about physical threats. They're serving in the military. They're protecting the rest of us. And, you know, since there are actual threats in the world, this is not a bad thing. And so uh, it's not a, a, a silly thing to be afraid or to be con- uh, genuinely concerned about physical threats because they do exist. And certainly evolution would say this is not this is an adaptive kind of stance. Um, so it's just a variation. They're more concerned than the than others are, but it's not a, a, a silly thing to be uh, concerned with threats. Okay. Um, you know, another subject is the whole subject of stereotype threat. This work has been done by a lot of people. I maybe you've done some of it, but uh, it, it's interesting because I heard. Did you hear this whole thing on Radio Lab, the NPR show? calling into question the whole stereotype threat literature, and not all of it, but a particular uh, influential study about stereotype threat as it, opposed, as it applied to African-Americans was done a long time ago. Yes. 
and they were, I mean, they, they didn't pass judgment, but, but, but I, I, I suppose there were some failures to replicate or something. But anyway, w tell us about stereotype threat. Well, stereotype threat uh, has been found for many different uh, social groups and not just African Americans. The original work was done by Claude Steele. Uh, and uh, I think that's I think that yeah. was the case study in, in, in Radio Lab, but go ahead. Right. So so that was a, a small sort of initial demonstration study, but then Josh Aronson and, and others have done lots of work. And uh, the person that uh, I talk about in, in my book is Nalini Ambadi, uh, who did work on Asian American and Asian American females. Uh, so it was a whole wide variety of these different kinds of, of effects that have been demonstrated. In the case of uh, the Asian American girls, uh, they were of, uh, this has been found in, in high school age and adult uh, university uh, uh, students. Um, but the idea is that if you just merely have people check off their ethnic identity, so it's Asian or white or Hispanic or whatever, African American, uh, with Asian Americans, you do that and it's very in innocent and no one sees why it would have an effect. They actually do better on math tests if they checked off their Asian uh, identity. But if they, uh, if they check off their gender, male, female, uh, then they do worse. And these are people randomly assigned to one or the other condition. So the same individual, if their Asian identity has been sort of primed or uh, been made more salient, do better on math tests. But the, the gender stereotype is girls can't do math, girls can't do science. Uh, this is a problem with STEM uh, enrollments in college even. So uh, they, do, they do worse if their, their female identity has been, been triggered. Um, there's lots of studies on this with uh, female beauty, uh, you know, having uh, women try, university women try on swimsuits versus sweaters or other products, and they actually do worse um, on GMAT math tests after they tried on the swimsuit versus some other article of clothing. So we have this sort of gender stereotype, legacy ideology, you know, women are supposed to be valued on their beauty and their physical appearance, not so much their intellectual abilities. And uh, this, is, this is persistent. There's a whole lot of studies uh, confirming that. Now, um, you're, you're getting into why this particular older study by Claude Steele might not replicate. Now, I can, I can get into that issue because for one thing, um, that was a very early study. It wasn't the best, uh, probably, methods that they would use today because it was just, you know, 20 or 30 years ago and just starting out, a small N. Uh, and, uh, you know, also stereotypes and beliefs in our society change over time. Um, it's a moving target. Hmm. So we don't really know today if the same kind of content exists in the minds of our participants that existed in the 1980s with Claude Steele's work. But the overall idea of stereotype threat is definitely there for a variety of different stereotypes. Yeah, you know, when I re re read about the swimsuit um, study in your book, I mean, an alternative explanation for that particular finding occurred to me, but maybe they did, maybe parts of the experiment ruled this out. But... Um, I mean, they did it for both men and women. For men, uh, it didn't, uh, being, seeing themselves in a swimsuit and then taking the test did not have an effect. Right. But it occurred to me that maybe, I mean, I think women, uh, and again, this, this has to do uh, probably with stereotypes, but for whatever reason, uh, may be more self-conscious and may be more inclined to judge themselves negatively if they see themselves in a swimsuit um, so couldn't it just be that like their self-esteem was lower or they were deflated or, I mean, so, so I guess, I guess the thing would be to give them a test also on something that women are stereotypically good at or something. Mm, I, I don't go. know, but, but, but right. that a crazy objection. No, that would be good. Uh, you'd expect them to do better if, if that was true, because you've got this female identity, uh, active. But the problem is it's not just that beauty is good. It's that it's, it's like the dumb blonde kind of stereotype that, you're evaluated on your looks and, and it actually might be a negative to be smart. You know, it might be a negative to be a, a brainy uh, a female as far as being attractive to males. And that's sort of the old, old stereotype that they're, they're playing with. Um, yeah. I mean, I, actually what you said about the deflated self-esteem and, and feeling, you know, not so worthy is actually, a, I think a, a viable alternative. It's not really all that different though. The idea is that by, by emphasizing this aspect of their identity, they feel less good about themselves and then maybe less motivated to do well in school or any kind of test that comes right, out. Right. But it's a little, uh, uh it's a little, I, I mean, it, the, where the difference plays out would be if they, if they didn't do, 
you know, if, if it's just self-esteem, if they're just deflated and they just don't have the self-confidence to do anything well, that should apply even to tasks that stereotypically females do well at. So there is a difference in the way it plays out and in the hypothesized mechanism that's being activated. Right. And uh, this is a, a fairly sophisticated, complicated study uh, that I didn't do. But I, I know that the researchers uh, do think through all those kinds of things. Yeah. And as long as we're, we're uh, indulging my longstanding alternative explanations, there's a famous study you mentioned in the book where uh, if a guy encounters uh, a girl on a rickety bridge, right. he's more likely to call her up and ask her out later than if it's on a perfectly safe, uh, stable bridge. And the standard explanation is that, um, you know, feelings of arousal such as that uh, generated by a, by a rickety bridge, are subject to um, the, 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 the interpret your body's kind of interpretation of them is subject to context, right? So if there's a woman there, the arousal may be interpreted by you as romantic or sexual arousal. That's the standard explanation. My yeah. question is, could it not also be that like the guy's thinking again, maybe unconsciously, but like. She saw me being totally calm in this unsafe situation. She's probably impressed. Uh, okay, but then why would they be more likely to call her back? Because they think she will go on a she will go on a date. They're imagining that she was impressed. Uh, okay, that's possible. I I don't know. I mean, I think that's that's uh, <laughs> that's you. possible. Thank you. I've been harboring that for years. Uh, okay. Uh, possibly since Psych 101 decades ago, but uh yeah, uh, that's possible. Yeah, sure. Uh so um let's see. There was uh um I want to uh, I want to see if we have more to work on here. I want to get into the whole issue of temptation and self-control, which you get into. Yes. But um, um, is there more on this front? Is there more in this kind of uh, genre of experiment that you want to emphasize? Maybe work you've done in in self-control and well, well, no, we'll get to that. But I mean, stereotype threat or uh, or or you know, just other things that you think are even distantly related that are really important. Well, I'll tell you uh, uh, something that's kind of related that you talk about is that we were talking about a, a, a woman's gender stereotype kind of mechanism being activated. Mm -hmm. You also did work on the activation of the Protestant work ethic. Yes. Is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these woe if true things, as they say on Twitter, because it's, it's just, well, there are two dimensions of it. Talk about the generic one where just the effect that the word heaven has on Americans in your findings? We are a very religious country and we are an anomaly. Uh, we're an exceptional country in this regard because we're an advanced uh, economy and uh, most of the advanced economies in the world have gone the other direction over the last 50 years and become much more secular. Uh, the percentage of people who go to uh, religious service weekly uh, is, is uh, 10, 20 percent at most in the in the European countries and other countries with advanced economies uh, really have become more secular. We have not changed. We are at the same percentage of people go to church on Sunday or Saturday uh, in the U.S. as they did in the 1940s. Um, more people believe in God and believe in the devil as, as, as real, uh, over 70% in the U.S. compared to 5% in, in European countries. And so uh, people have wondered why it is that we have this kind of uh, religious, uh, continuing religious uh, ideology or, or, or theme in our country. And it's been traced to sort of the Puritan, the founding Puritan ethic, uh, where um, people escaping religious per uh, persecution in England came over uh, in the 1600s. And they brought with them not only this uh, this connection with, uh, with with religion and belief in God, but also the Protestant work ethic that uh, we, we're valued uh, in terms of how hard we work, and uh, that's how we get to heaven is by working hard. And and, and even the um, the Puritan ethic of being chaste and uh, uh, and and not being promiscuous and being and dressing conservatively, and all these things are, are very much connected to each other in our in our country to some funny extents. Because I had a wonderful uh, graduate student, uh, Andy Pullman, who's now a professor at Clemson, who's done a lot of work on ideology, 
And uh, he traveled around the world and, and asked people the same question in Asia, in, in Italy, in, in South America, in, in all over the world. And the question was basically, imagine a potato peeler or a dishwasher, very low end, uh, not making any money, working hard, a uh, very poor person. They suddenly win, uh, win the lottery. And in two versions, one is the person then, you know, quits the potato peeling job and, uh, and relaxes and has a nice life. Or the other one is the potato peeler continues to work peeling potatoes or washing dishes or whatever it was, even after he wins the lottery. And around the world, what do you think of this person? And around the world, everyone thinks he's nuts. I mean, like, what's this guy, you know, who wins the lottery, he's still washing dishes in a restaurant. But Americans love this guy. And we're the only country in the world who loves this guy. <laughs> and, uh, it's, and, and, and I do too. I mean, I hear that story. Yeah, what a great, you know, he's still working, even though he has the money, you know, what a guy. And, uh, it, but everyone else thinks he's nuts. You know, he's like, a, he's an idiot for doing this. Uh, so that, that's sort of an example of how basic this Protestant work ethic is in our, in our society and how it influences what we think about people. Yeah, and so you did a study where... Um this is this is an example of a priming study where you you present people with a stimulus and they they, they don't consciously recognize how it's going to influence their future behavior in some priming studies the stimulus is actually subliminal so something is flashed so briefly it doesn't enter conscious awareness but this isn't that kind it isn't subliminal priming it, it's a case where they they read some passage that had the word heaven in it right and what was the effect uh, I'm not sure which study. I'm sorry, which which one you're talking well, about. Well, I, I think um, uh, there's a lot of religious priming studies actually uh, that do that kind of thing. People become more moral. Uh, they become more honest. There's a lot of pro-social uh, consequences of religious priming, and there's many, many hundreds of studies now that uh, that have demonstrated that. Well, I, I think it um, it it somehow primed the Protestant work ethic. Okay. I forget the exit. It, it, it involved like at work on an anagram, an anagram or something. It made the work harder oh, okay. or something. Yeah, sure. These uh, Eric Yulman was another student at the time. They did a lot of these kinds of studies, um, and they did them together, Andy and Eric, uh, and uh, and wrote chapters and, and articles about them. As I recall, I mean, you're, uh, the the heaven prime caused people to. Uh, work harder and solve more anagrams afterwards. And I think that's only in, in our country because of this Protestant work ethic. Oh, the idea okay. of religion and hard work being intertwined and combined. There's another one. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing because we have both, right? We have the Protestant work ethic, but also the Puritan ethic about promiscuity. And if you uh, have people remind about somebody who works hard in America only, they also are more con uh, condemning of a person who uh, dresses in a provocative way. They, they are more in favor of dress codes in high school after they hear about somebody who works hard. And so why would that is semantically, logically unrelated? But in the United States only, since those two are combined in our founding ideology, uh, you have an effect of working hard causes people to be more, uh, you know, in line with the Puritan ethic, too. Okay, so I was thinking you had done that study. Maybe you didn't. Um, and maybe you didn't do this one either. But this was the one where I thought I would definitely like to see it replicated. Not that it couldn't be the case. It just seemed like amazing to me. Um, where with Asian Americans, when they primed their, the, the American part of their identity, like some of them, they would, they would give material that, that mentioned Asian foods and so on, and some they would activate things with references to American culture. Asian Americans who were primed with references to American culture uh, were more puritanical in their answers to certain questions, right? Like, for example, the, the dress code, for example, the high school dress code. Uh, if Asian Americans uh, describe their favorite American food, like hamburgers or steaks or something, then they're more puritanical as far as their uh, feelings about a, a you know provocative dress in high school. But if they're um, asked what their favorite Asian food is, they're not. It's it's really only about uh, their American part of their identity. There's a whole lot of really fascinating work going on right now about cultural uh, genetics, even or cultural epigenetics that. Uh, uh, students, for example, from China who then come and go to school at, say, Ann Arbor at Michigan or someplace like that actually are showing uh, genetic changes uh, in their RNA uh, based on the fact that they have a new cultural experience, which is that blows people away because no one ever thought that was possible, that your own personal life experience would cause changes to your genes. And this is this fascinating new field 
that many people are working on, uh, but showing actual, what, 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 what that means then is that these characteristics or, or behaviors or traits will then be passed down to your children, right? Because it's in your genetic uh, makeup uh, so that your own children will be more uh, of that new culture where you have moved from. Uh, so this is a whole new thing in the last, you know, uh, five to 10 years. Um, and it's, uh, it's just changing the way we think about genetics. Yeah. Um, the whole issue of epigenetics is something I really have to look into and get into and talk to more people about it. Because, uh, yes, the idea is that in some sense, but in some kind of obscure and, and not straightforward sense, um, environmental influences can perhaps affect the genetic information you transmit to your your offspring, it's less than straightforward, so I shouldn't say anything more about it than that. But um, so quickly, I said we would talk about temptation and stuff. One thing you and I have in common is that we both decided at some point in our lives that we just would not drink. Yes. Now, uh, and I've, I've uh, uh, one thing I've said about myself is I don't have micro discipline. I have some macro discipline. And uh, you, um, one thing you say in the book is, Actually, it turns out that most people that we think of as being able to resist temptation, what they're doing is constructing their environment in a way that there just isn't much temptation. Absolutely. That's the best, most effective way there is. And this is funny because of the idea of self-control and willpower has always been this effortful willpower uh, struggle uh, to, to uh, uh, stifle these impulses. And the people who are really, the, it turns out, this is very new research, uh, last five, six years, uh, the people who are very effective at self-control really are the ones who uh, rely on the more automatic and the less effortful ways, like not not buying the desserts to have in the refrigerator as a temptation or not having the alcohol at home uh, or, or structuring their, their world where uh, it's very easy to exercise and very easy to do the things that they want to and developing good habits, new habits that and then they just they don't have to decide or even try. They just actually do the thing they want to do. Yeah, of course, it takes a kind of self-discipline, I guess, at least at the self supermarket not to buy the stuff. But that's Absolutely. different from having to muster at every moment of your waking life. Right. Uh, in your case, um, you say that uh, your decision to quit drinking had to do with realizing that you had been doing something for unconscious reasons that weren't accessible to your conscious mind, which was you were driving you wanted to get home quickly yes. on a long trip, a multi-hour trip, and you realized finally that it was because the liquor store closed at 8.30 and you had to be of that. Yeah, it was uh, Thanksgiving dinner. It was 2002, I remember. And um, I, uh, uh, I was driving back from Chattanooga, which is about 900-something miles, and uh, leaving at 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday. And I just had the idea. It would be a great challenge to see if I could make it all the way back to New York uh, in 12 hours by 8.30 that evening. Um, and so I did, and I remember uh, getting out of the car at 8.30 in the parking garage in Manhattan, and uh, instead of, uh, I found myself walking a different direction, not towards my apartment, but a different way, and uh, out of the garage, and where I was heading was right to the uh, local liquor store. And I realized as I walked in the door, I, I was getting something that I, I didn't have anything at home, uh, any alcohol, any wine, or, 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 or beer, or anything like that. Uh, and, uh, and that's not what I was doing. I was, uh, I was buying it and it struck me because I had been thinking about trying to stop uh, drinking anyway. And it struck me that, um, uh, the whole point of getting home in 12 hours was so I could get to liquor stores before they closed at nine o'clock because they weren't open on Sunday. And that would mean I wouldn't have anything uh, for Saturday or Sunday to drink. And that's how dependent I was. Um, that it was influencing my goal to drive home, which I thought the whole time driving home was just this challenge of doing it in 12 hours, which uh, makes no sense at all. You know, there's an underlying reason for that, for that, uh, for that goal I had. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I said, I mean, I, I quit drinking too. It's not like I would have been an alcoholic. It's, it's just that like moderation didn't seem to come all that naturally to me. Yeah. It just seemed like it would be like a on balance, I would do, uh, you know, uh, be better. W was that kind of your situation? I mean, well, in a way, uh, I, I had more of a motivation because I was uh, 50 or so. Uh, I was late 40s back then. And uh, I was, um, uh, we were trying to have kids and I didn't have any children yet. And, uh, but what was happening was I was starting to have those blackouts, you know, that were become very uh, famous with the Kavanaugh a case mm -hmm. recently, you know, this idea that I would uh, the next morning not have memory for some things 
uh, or a stretch of time in the, the preceding evening, and I, I realize I cannot have a baby and I cannot have a child hmm. where if I'm doing that, I don't have any memory. And I, I decided, you know, for that reason, that was my strong motivation. Um, the daughter was born a few years later, but I just had to, had to stop that so it, um, it wouldn't happen when, after she was born. Yeah, okay, well, good. And you talk about your daughter in the book. Uh, uh, yes, a lot. And I dedicated the uh, book to her. Um, uh, she had a big influence on me. She was uh, born just before I had that um, uh, alligator dream in 2006. Uh, and uh, like a lot of parents, and especially psychologists, uh, maybe, uh, you know, you learn a lot about human nature and a lot about, um, uh, about people by, by observing uh, your child as they grow up and uh, see what they can or can't do and what affects them and things like that. And uh, so I did pay a lot of attention um, to her um, growing, uh, while she was growing up. And yeah, she changed my life. You know, that's what everyone says. It was, it was a fantastic experience. I was a new father for the first time at age 51. So it was a little different than usual. And most people at the playgrounds thought I was a grandpa instead of a, a father, you know, because I was about that age, but, uh, and she's 12 now and doing great. And, um, uh, yeah, uh, she's, she's in the book a lot. Yeah, you mentioned one thing, uh, uh, like many parents, you found yourself sometimes impatient with her. You'd come home from work and you'd be, she'd be trying to show you something and you wouldn't be focusing as much as you should. And you, you developed a kind of like, uh, uh, almost a ritual that you did to, to kind of improve your response? This is one of these, you know, um, uh, we were talking about priming uh, influences before. And for me, priming is just another way that uh, the, the, a situation carries over to affect you, uh, you know, in, in what comes next. And, and a standard classic one is bringing your work home with you. And a lot of people have that problem of uh, being stressed out at work and bringing it home, being grouchy. Uh, and, and I have an occupation where, uh, like many people, um, I'm doing things for other people most of the day. And when you're a teacher, a professor running a lab, your, your uh, students and other people want you to do things for them. They want help with a paper, uh, write a recommendation letter, this, that, the other thing. And, and you spend your day doing these things, uh, helping other people. And by the end of the day, it's like, oh, hang on. I sort of you know, want to just chill and, and, and uh, relax for a while. And, uh, and, and my daughter, as soon as I get home, wants attention. She's missed me all day. She runs up, daddy, daddy. It's fantastic. You know? and, and I'm sitting there, and she comes and wants to show me all the things she drew, her artwork, because she, she even today is still really into art and artist, an artist. Uh, and and I, I remember just being, you know, daddy just wants to you know, relax for a little bit, and, and maybe in a little while, you know, we can do that. And but she was just so happy to see me and wanting to show and share what she had been done when I wasn't there all day. And then it didn't take that long. It was a few minutes later, I realized, oh, no, you know, this is the most, this is the, what makes my life worth living. It's, it's the best part of my life. And here I am pushing her off and, and telling her, you know, to leave me alone for a while. And that's horrible. And I realized she, I was understanding her as yet another person who was demanding my attention to, to look at them and, and do something for them. And like, no, 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 no. That's not the way I want to encode this experience at all. So what I did was I used Peter Goldwitzer's technique. And I use this, uh, I talk about this in the last chapter on mind control, which is fantastic. I've had readers write to me emails that this has changed their life. They didn't know about this. And it really helps you get what you want and, and carry out your good intentions. And my intention was I would leave my work life. Uh, when I got home, I would leave it. I would be happy to be home. I would open that door and walk in and just be so happy that and, and feel so blessed that I have this wonderful daughter and uh, spend time with her and, and enjoy it. And what I did was I, I created what's called an implementation intention, which is really just using this idea that environmental cues trigger your, uh, your desired behavior without your having to think about it or decide. It's like an automatic thing. And my implementation intention was when I get home and I open the door and I put my foot on my driveway, which always happens because I've never come home from work and sat in my car all night uh, without getting out and putting my foot in the driveway. So very reliable event. I, when I put my foot in the driveway, I will forget my work life and just realize and feel good about being home and look forward to opening that door and being with my daughter. And it works so well. It just changed everything. I would immediately feel this, this happiness and this relief uh, from the day's uh, stress. And I would open the door and just you know, pick her up and be with her and until she got finally to sleep at night. And uh, it, it changed everything. It was wonderful. Do you actually like pause or did you one point like pause, stop, like after you got out of the car? It, it is that kind of effect. For me, it was I would I would actually want to stop. 
I would want to stop and break from uh, what was going on in my mind and, and just totally clear it. So it was like I would step out and I would feel this feeling like something shifted. You know, it was like a seismic shift or maybe not seismic, but, you know, a shift that the, the reality had just changed, had shifted. And, and, I, and it would always happen when my foot hit the pavement because that was the cue um, that, that I, I – uh, that I made, you know, I, I have uh, the other time, the first time I ever used it, I tried it out after I hear, heard about it. I had a book uh, at, when I was at NYU, my colleague, I borrowed from a colleague and he wanted it back. He was writing a paper and I said, okay, I'll bring it in. Well, the next day, where's the book? Oh, I forgot. You know, next day, oh, I forgot. I would, I would have the good intention of bringing the book back, but I always forgot. I forgot about it later on, which is the problem with conscious intentions. Often you forget them. I forget what you to I find, yes. Yeah. So what I did was I said, okay, when I get home, I will immediately go put the book in my briefcase, and then it'll be there. So when I come in the next morning, it'll be there. So I come home on my apartment in, in the Greenwich Village, and I open the door. It's dark, and I find myself walking into the bedroom in the dark. I'm like, what am I? And I realized what I was doing is walking right to my desk, and I was standing in front of my desk looking down, and there was the book. Before I, I totally forgot again about bringing this book in. Aha! So I and I don't usually walk into the bedroom in the dark. I usually go into the kitchen. I can get something you know to drink or eat. And I went right to my bedroom in the dark. I put the book in my book uh, in my briefcase, and that was the end of it. It was the first time I'd ever tried it. Um, and it does. The, the trick is that it has to be something that really is you're sure is going to happen. So, for example, people who pick their uh, children up at say five o'clock. Well, what about uh, if it's a day where they get out early? And you have to go at three. Well, you can forget. They could be standing on the street in front of the school for two hours. So you can say, you know, when the clock strikes three or some other cue that reminds you that it's three, you know, uh, then I will immediately get up and, and head to the car and, and, and do that. So it, it helps you when you're doing something that's a little unusual, that's not your usual habit. And, and so it turns out to be a great way to break a bad habit uh, or to start a new one. Uh, people who want to exercise can say, you know, and they're not finding the time or they're forgetting to exercise. When I come home and I'm changing upstairs in the bedroom out of my work clothes, I will immediately put on my sh running shorts and my running shoes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And you start doing that and you realize, you know, what else would I do if, with my running shoes and my running shorts on but go out for a run, you know, and it works great. Yeah, you look pretty silly just going yeah. to a bar in your uh, running gear. Absolutely. So, um, so uh Let's before we talk about the replication issue, let's talk about one more set of experiments you're associated with. It takes us back kind of to your mentor, uh, Zions or Zions, um, uh, who, who emphasized that, like, the reason we, you know, we evaluate things as positive or negative, often without realizing it, is because since the beginning of animal life, it's there have been things that animals needed to approach and things that animals needed to avoid. I mean, bacteria approach things and avoid things and positive and negative affect seems to be the thing that's associated with it. So it's deeply built into us. And you, I, I think you're the one who did this. You kind of operationalized this in the form of the lever pulling, pushing thing. Right, right, right. Do you want to talk about that? Sure that what we realized was that this is such a fundamental, and Bob and Bob Zions uh, pointed this out you know, first, uh, a fundamental reaction to the world is approach or avoid, to, to go towards or, or be away or to something as friend or something as foe. And that is the most primitive reaction we have to almost anything. And, and as you say, protozoa, single cell um, organisms have the same thing uh, as do uh, all the way through the animal kingdom uh, spectrum. So uh, that, that we have these immediate good and bad reactions, not so that little good and bad um, things happen in our head, but because natural selection only operates on, on what we actually do, on actual behavior. So it would make sense that these are connected to actually doing something immediately. So we uh, used what uh, other people had found with uh, sort of an automatic good-bad evaluation for anything, even though you're not trying to evaluate them. But we uh, connected the effect to instead of saying the word out loud or making some kind of uh, a mental decision, we connected it to a lever where they pushed a lever or pulled a lever as fast as they could when they saw the thing that was good or bad. And what happened was people were faster to to use the approach muscles uh, of pushing, uh, of reaching for something, of, of approaching something with their hand uh, when it was good. And they were faster to pull their hand back and pull the lever backwards when it was a bad thing even though they weren't trying to evaluate. They were just pulling the lever or pushing the lever to make their response. 
So immediately after deciding in a split second whether something is good or bad, again, without even intending to, our muscles are, are predisposed to do the right thing, uh, to approach or avoid that thing as a very crude but very fast and adaptive response. So if I... Um so one of the versions of this is you show me a bunch of things on the screen and you say every time you see one, pull the lever towards you. When I see things that I have positive associations with, I will pull faster, even though you didn't, you told me to pull as fast as I can in every case, but it will take me a little longer if I see, you know, like rattlesnakes, an obvious case because you actually literally want to get away from a rattlesnake. That's right. But even things where it's subtler and you wouldn't be evading the object, if it's negatively valenced, you're saying it, it, it will take me lo a little bit longer to do the pulling. And with right. pushing, it would be the opposite. It would exactly. be rattlesnake would be fast, right. uh, you know, and so on. So right. um, now this, this is, and you've done a variety of things uh, with it. In fact, one of the things, I mean, you didn't do this, but uh, some experimenter says they've found a way to actually weaken the effect of stereotype by by like getting people to what is it like if they see African Americans I mean assuming they have a mm -hmm. they're biased against them then then the deal would be they pull the lever toward them when they see an image of an African American and and this supposedly has some positive actual effect on their subsequent attitude <laughs> It does. It does. It takes a lot of training, though. It takes like an hour of doing this. And you do see these changes in their implicit attitudes uh, because they've been either pulling the lever or pushing the lever. So there is a sort of a feedback from the actual response you're making uh, that changes your attitude. Uh, it's probably I don't think they meant it to be uh, not a way that we can actually change stereotypes and biases in society because it's a, a lot of, you know, an hour of pulling and pushing levers. But what they were trying to show is that these uh, these kinds of implicit racial cultural stereotypes we have can be changed in ways that we don't even realize that are causing a change in our mind through this kind of a muscular uh, approach or avoidance mechanism. Okay, and we should um, we should emphasize the word implicit without going into it. Just mm -hmm. I would just make the point that it's not like these people are then giving given a questionnaire like how do you feel toward black people? How do you right. feel toward white people? With the implicit uh, method of assessing uh, bias. Uh, the idea is, uh, if the logic is sound, that you're not aware at all of what is being gauged. Um, you know, you're not being asked to respond positively or negatively to anything. It shows up much more subtly. So right, 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 right. Right. I mean, there's is, ways that we we leak uh, information about how we really feel uh, when we're even when we're trying to control it, like our facial expression. We may sort of leak the fact that we don't really, you know, mm, not that enthusiastic about yeah. something. Uh, but implicit just basically means we're we're revealing something we don't realize that we're revealing. I, my, one of my favorite examples is when people complete sentences and say, "Here is a sentence, complete it," and uh, you get all these kind of stereotypes come revealing. Uh, for example, um, Bob uh, got out of uh, the taxi uh, and um, yelled at the cab driver, and then there's a, a blank. And, or Susie uh, got out of the cab and yelled at the cab driver, and there's a blank. And people are much more likely to use the word because and give some explanation when it violates their stereotype. So Bob got out of the cab and yelled at the cab driver and then walked to work. Or Susie got out of the uh, cab and yelled at the cab driver because she had a headache. And yeah. so by feeling a need to explain things, it shows that you found that surprising or unexpected. Um, and we don't realize that that's showing any kind of bias or stereotype. And in fact, the lever effect could be used to reveal implicit attitudes. The idea would be that if it takes you longer, if you're just saying, if the, if the instruction is pull with every picture, but it's taking you longer to pull with some, that would be implicitly revealing uh, a negative association, relatively negative association with those things. So yeah. that, that leads to, um, to, the, to the replication issue, because that is, I mean, we should say a ton of experiments. Now, there is a wave of like attempted replication a lot of experiments are failing to replicate, which isn't decisive in itself, uh, but a couple of the experiments are yours, and one of them involves the, the levers, right? Uh, the lever pulling. There's a, there's a somebody did that and, and said it failed to replicate, right? Uh, there's a lot more studies that, that actually found it. So what, what's going on there is a, a 15 years of research, um, and people are actually improving the technique. 
Uh, they're making the, the display on the screen of, of recede from you or, or move towards you. Uh, and, uh, and, and in those kinds of techniques, uh, 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 people at the University of Grenoble, for example, have several papers uh, showing this technique now, and it's very reliable and it works fine. So we had a, you know, the first study in 1999. We just had a lever going back and forth with very crude kind of displays on the computer screen. But if you make those displays so they really feel the, the thing on the screen actually moves backwards or forwards as if you're really moving forwards or, or you're really pulling it and it's moving towards you or you're pushing the lever and it moves away from you, then they get very reliable effects. So actually the most recent research with the best techniques are showing the effect very well in that case. But your, your point is more general about, about the replication uh, issue in psychology. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm fortunate because um, uh, there, there have been very uh, many uh, large-scale meta-analysis reviews of 300, 400 studies in several of the domains that I did the early studies with. Uh, for example, that automatic evaluation good-bad uh, study uh, that we found in, in 1991 or two. Now there's 25 years of research on that and it concludes it's a very, uh, very reliable effect. I and mean, we don't do these reviews. These are other people doing them. But a quarter century of research on that makes the same conclusion after hundreds of studies uh, that we did. The imitation, chameleon effect, where people naturally imitate or mimic each other is being used right now as a way to uh, study uh, uh, drinking in college students. Uh, who are sort of imitating and mimicking each other and, and binge drinking because they think that's what everyone is doing. And the mimicry and imitation is a very big part of how much uh, students drink when they're with other students. And there's a lot of other research demonstrating, you know, this kind of uh, imitation and mimicry effect in young children and so forth. So in, in pretty much, uh, there's also a big review of the priming literature, the verbal priming uh, to do uh, behaviors based on seeing words in some test beforehand. That, that's probably the, the most controversial thing that I was ever involved in. And a review in 2016, again, 350 studies concludes over all those research that it's a very reliable and, uh, and replicable effect. These, these papers come out in Psychological Bulletin, for example, which is one of the prestigious, uh, highest, um, most cited um, uh, uh, pay, uh, journals in the uh, psychological world. So in every uh, area of research that I've been associated with, the meta-analysis uh, of, of all the studies done shows these are reliable effects that have been replicated. Now, there are others that have not been as replicated. I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, our warm, cold uh, coffee study, for example, it was in Science uh, Magazine about 10 years ago. And people doing that original uh, design that we used uh, have not uh, replicated as we much should, as other people We should say what that, what, what that was, as I recall, yeah. was something like where... Here you go. Um, yeah. Like, whether you are given a cold or warm beverage will influence, what was it, whether you behave coldly or warmly toward people or have those kinds That's of attitudes. Right. And so, I got to say, when I saw that, I thought, you know, with some of these things, you think, well, I can see why that would be. With that one, I, I was like, I don't see why that would be, why, why there would be such a transfer from one domain to another. Anyway, yes. what's the status of that? That's, that, that's uh, got a very happy ending for me. Uh, but at the time, uh, what we were doing was replicating the very first impression formation study ever done by Solomon Ash in 1946. So we're using, you, you might you know, expect, very crude methods. The first ever study anyone did with impression, we replicated his study. And all he did was to give people six personality traits, like independent, aloof, uh, intelligent, things like that. But he varied one word, and the word he added to, for some people, was warm, and the word he added for other people was cold. And that warm-cold difference between those two sets made a huge difference in the impression. People like the warm person. They don't like the cold person. And we did the same study, but we took out the words warm and cold, and we had people briefly hold up cup of hot or a paper cup of hot coffee or iced coffee and as you were getting ready to do the experiment like oh here hold this for a second I'll get your papers oh thank you very much you take it back uh, they either held briefly hot coffee or, or iced coffee if they had held the iced coffee they behaved as if the people had seen the word warm in the original ash study and if they held the iced coffee they uh, thought the person, uh, they did not like the person as much. Now, everybody in the study saw exactly the same information. The only difference was had they just briefly held the iced or the, the warm coffee. Now, it turns out there's, there really is a reason for this effect, uh, and it's actually because our brain is hardwired to uh, connect feelings of physical warmth 
with feelings of social warmth. Uh, the guy who wrote the original attachment work, John Bowlby, actually argued back in the 1970s that this would be the case for all breastfeeding mammals because there's a conflation in our early experience as infants being held more close to the mother at, during breastfeeding and the physical warmth of the mother's body is associated with the fact that she's feeding us, we can trust her, she protects us, uh, she has our back, and all those good things that really are associated with social warmth, that you can trust the person, they're generous, they care for you, they have your interests at heart. And that's conflated in experience with physical warmth. Um, if you remember those, uh, those Harlow monkey studies with the monkeys raised with the wire mother or the cloth mother, the ones with the wire mother were horrible, raised in isolation. They couldn't function later on as adults. They huddled in the corner and rocked. It was very pathetic. But the ones with the cloth mother were okay. They weren't the best. They were raised in isolation, after all. But behind, they don't mention this very much, but behind the cloth was a 100-watt light bulb. So what they had and the wire mother monkeys did not have was a source of physical warmth, not social warmth, but the physical warmth was enough for those monkeys to be okay, you know, uh, as adults. So there's neuroscience now since our original study, which was paper and pencil, and that's all. But the neuroscience has imaged people's uh, uh, brains. This is done at UCLA, many studies now, and showed the same small part of the human uh, brain called insula, which is a walnut-shaped area right in the middle, uh, becomes active both when you hold something warm, like a hot cup of coffee, and when you're texting your family and friends on your smartphone. And study after study shows the same little area becomes active for both. So Bowlby was right, and he, made, he had a logical evolutionary argument for why that would be the case. But this is now around the world. It's part of the human mind, the human brain, uh, and the warm-cold effect is universal. It is because our brains are actually wired to connect feelings of physical warmth to feelings of social warmth. Um, and if I could say one more thing, because uh, you know, I like to uh, put life hacks in the book. You know, I, I, several times I say, sort of gave advice about you know, what to do. Um, this is something for, for new parents or for parents with their infants. Just hug them. Just hold them. Because the infant mind has a very crude little device uh, to, that understands um, you know, to detect whether somebody is somebody they can care, that cares about them, they should bond with, and, and has their interests at heart. And that's just the physical warmth. So these physical warmth experiences with the, the mother and the father uh, actually are a cue to the infant that this is somebody you can trust and, uh, and, and you can bond with. And that, that actually that bonding at very early ages predicts lots of things the rest of life about friendships and breaking up and things like that in their you know, 20s and 30s. So it's actually a very easy thing to do. And it, it signals to the child that um, they can trust you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, one more point on, on the uh, replication. Um, I mean, as we said, the, the allegation isn't that, that fraud's going on. It's that unconscious uh, biases of the experimenter or, or are coming into play. In fact, I think I looked at one of these replication studies where they actually tried to show the, that not only the effect didn't hold up, but uh, th they were arguing that, that when they manipulated the, the uh, expectations of the observers, the experimental observers, Yep. Though they had uh, that had an effect uh, yes. on, on whether the observer saw the effect. Yes. Now, uh, I, I, if we can find that, maybe we'll link to it. I, I'm not recalling it that clearly. But there are other ways. Um, uh, I mean, I mean, some various ways unconscious bias could enter in. W one is, well, we didn't get the effect we wanted. Oh, I realize we this was there was something wrong in the experimental setup. Well, let's do it again. Well, we didn't quite get the, oh, we, we forgot to do this. We, well, if you keep doing an experiment over and over and your definition of the good setup is the one where you get the effect you want, you know, eventually sure. you'll get, chance alone says you'll eventually get the effect. So that's right. one problem. Another is like saying, oh, well, the very, this particular variable, we didn't find the effect, but oh, here's another variable. And that's somewhat the same way where, you, where, where you've got all these different correlations to choose from. Yeah, sure, you can find one. Uh, the point I was I was getting around to is that um, you said that that meta analysis seems to vindicate these. Now, meta analysis is basically uh, a, a method that doesn't delve, you know, deeply into the individual experiments. It looks at a bunch of experiments and says, well, if all these different experimenters found this effect or the or, or the bulk of them, the chances of that being due to chance alone are are very slim. On the other hand. The claim from some of these critics is not that the effect is due to chance alone. In other words, the biases aren't random. So if you take something like stereotype threat, they would say, 
Well, psychologists are famously liberal. They hear about this finding where uh, the reason women do less well on math tests is because they've absorbed the stereotype. Uh, a bunch of them would love to validate that. So they all study the same thing. They all have the bias and they all get the bad results. That is the allegation. And meta-analysis would not see through that problem, right? It would not. Well, I mean, uh, there's many things you brought up there. Uh, I'll, I'll try to deal with them. Uh, first of all, the kinds of, uh, you know, a cherry picking or doing a study till you find the result you like is very bad experimentation. And people who do that uh, uh, usually are found out by the fact that uh, people cannot replicate it all what they find. Meta-analysis shows that people are able to find the same, uh, the same effect uh, over hundreds of studies. Uh, and so that rules out people who are just finding something that, uh, that isn't true, isn't real, and just coming up with the data set that shows it. Those, those studies usually fall off really fast uh, if someone's that kind of an experimenter. Uh, that that uh, is very unethical and, and very poor practice, and uh, hopefully those people don't have much of a career. Um, Meta-analysis also takes into account, however, what's called a file drawer effect. And this is a big criticism mm -hmm. of review articles because they say, look, there's a publication bias. And the publication bias means only positive effects are going to be published. No one's going to publish studies that didn't work because it's not interesting or there's many reasons for that. And so meta-analysis, the, the way it's done today, which is different maybe than it used to, is to really try and solicit from everybody what's in their file drawer. They do calls and, and uh, emails and they really uh, uh, beat the bushes for all the studies that didn't work because the, the original... Um, claims made about priming, for example, in 2012, was that people's file drawers were stuffed with failures to replicate uh, priming studies. And so the people who said, well, you know, let's find out about that and really made a big effort. Look, if you've got these studies in your file drawer, please send them to us. We want all the studies, not just publications. And so they really tried to find those and they did find some. So taking all of those into account, they still said it's a reliable effect and a robust effect, even with studies in the file drawer. And I will make a logical point here is that uh, oftentimes studies in file drawers are, are actually positive results that did find the effect. But, but the journal says, we already know this. It's already been published. So you're not telling us anything new by showing this effect yet again. And I've had students in the past write me and say, I can't get this published. That's a positive priming effect because people say they've already shown this and I'm not adding anything new to it. So, you know, it, it works both ways uh, mm -hmm. as far as this publication bias. You have to do something new, not just a positive result. So, you know, these kinds of things are out there. And I think it's really, I, I just want to say, a positive development in our, in our field uh, that we're so concerned with this issue of replication. Uh, we're also, uh, a, a, very, a big improvement also has been uh, having larger ends, larger numbers of people in studies. Because when we started, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we had small studies, 25, 50 people, and, and we didn't worry about large ends. And, and, and uh, I think now we're much more sensitive to that, and we don't get things published anymore if they're just small little studies, like I used to do, like we all used to do uh, back in the day when our field was starting. So there's been some real improvements in methods, some real improvements in statistics, uh, but there is bias in both directions. I just want to say it, that there's people saying, oh, there's a publication bias, but now there's uh, you know, some encouragement uh, among people on social media uh, to publish failures to replicate, and those are the things that are rewarded uh, now uh, for some people. I don't think there should be rewards either direction. You know, We should be concerned with what's the truth, and conveying that to the public so it can be used by people who are paying our salaries and paying our grant money and through taxes. Uh, I think that we should be more uh, attuned to telling the truth to people and not uh, being tribes where some people say these effects exist and, and try to argue and, and maybe have a bias towards that. And people say they don't have a bias the other direction. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I think we have biases on both sides now and it's, it's muddling up um, of the situation for our science. You know, you were saying at the beginning, people don't say this is due to fraud, but I remember early on, because of the Diedrich Stoppel case in Holland, that if you uh, if your studies were not replicated by people, then you were immediately thought to have made up the data. And people would even say uh, on Twitter and, and other uh, social media that you made up your data, you're a fraud, because they couldn't replicate you. Mm -hmm. And this was a very scary, bullying, kind of fearful environment that still exists to some extent, but really existed back in 2012, 13, and 14.
and and you can use it as reason that these people should read your book because in effect they weren't appreciating the extent to which unconscious motivation can influence them. I mean, this is why I'm very reluctant to use the word lie about yeah. anyone because even you know Donald Trump, you know uh, newspapers have aggregated lists of how many times he lied, and I'm like, no, a lie is a conscious attempt to deceive. I have no idea what's going on in his head, and I'm pretty no. sure I wouldn't understand it if he showed it to me. But yeah. but. But I, I try to avoid concluding that when people say things that are untrue, they're doing it with conscious intent to deceive because uh, it's clear to me the human mind is designed to deceive itself as in the course of deceiving others. Yeah, and and, and, and then the other part of that, and you mentioned Trump and, and politics, is that we have become so tribal uh, and, and our, our, our desire, our motivated desire to believe certain things are true and other things are not. Uh, influences our conclusions, and we may be very well-meaning and think that we are on the on, on trying to tell the truth, and we don't realize the effect our motivations to want to believe certain things are affecting our assessment of the truth because these things operate unconsciously. Right. No, we all we pretty much all think we're uh, doing good. Uh, presumably, we can't all be right, but um, but anyway, listen. Uh, so this has been great. I wish we had had time to talk about more. I mean, the stuff about risk is very interesting. For example, how uh, yeah. people can be primed to engage in risky behavior. I mean, yes. like, uh, like, like a women, uh, if, if they're, if after visiting a dating site, seeing attractive men um, will be, will rate actually dangerous things like diet pills as less dangerous or certain less risky. Uh, certain tanning treatments that are right. dangerous, as less dangerous than they would otherwise. And right. I know men, you know, young males are famous for dying at a high rate because they indulge in so much risky behavior. And I think Definitely. a lot of times they are when they're showing off in front of women or, or just trying to gain the kind of status that will they think will impress women. Um, they're not thinking I'm you know, they're thinking, no, I'm going to win this fight. No, I can drive this fast. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. There is that kind of self-deception. And safe sex, too. The, 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 the deal with safe sex is you're very motivated, uh, obviously, to, uh, to um, have this wonderful you know, night with this, uh, this, your partner and all of that. And that is, uh, motivates you to say that's not is the, to lower the risk assess assessment of unprotected sex and so forth. Uh, and uh, we know that's a real health problem. Yeah. So a lot of, lot, of, lot of fascinating stuff in the book. It's called Before You Know It, The Unconscious Reasons. We do what we do. Thanks for uh, giving us so much of your time, John. This was fun. Been a pleasure, Bob. Thank you for having me on.